for those of you who um, don't know me, my name is Tamsin Ford and I am a child psychiatrist and I work with Stuart and I'm speaking with Astrid um, who's going to do the latter half of this talk. And um, I'm very, very well aware of what an amazing programme it's been and what a lot of very varied talks we've had. So I think you all deserve a medal for sitting here and I'm aware that it's Astrid and I that are between you and a walk in the sun. However, it is you that's between a, me and Astrid and a walk in the sun. So um, joking apart, let's talk a little bit about transition um, in ADHD. Now, ADHD was quite a controversial diagnosis not that long ago. So when I first started in child psychiatry in the mid-1990s, there was still, you know, I worked for people as a very junior trainee who didn't believe it, wouldn't treat it. That, thankfully, um, has gone away. But it means that we are increasingly having a cohort of young people who are growing up and daring to grow up and cross the boundary between child and adult services. And we have adult services that aren't set up to deal with them. So we're going to talk about this project, Catch Us. But first of all, I'm afraid I'm a boring academic, so we have to start with the definition of what transition, what we mean by transition, um, because it's more than just the transfer administratively from one, a young person's name from a clinical child service to a clinical adult. And if it is done well, it should help engagement and it should help their outcomes. So um, it should be purposeful, it should be planned, it needs to think about more than just the healthcare, um, and that is the data that's enshrined in our Department of Health policy. And I can see some looks around the room that I think some people have probably had some alternative experiences. <laughs> And the, the paediatricians are ahead of this on, uh, on us. Mental health services are set up basically to deal with episodes. So you have something that you're struggling with and maybe you're depressed or maybe you're anxious or maybe you have a psychotic illness. You come along, you get some help, you get better, you go away. Whereas paediatricians are more um, used to dealing with long-term conditions that follow people through the lifespan. So it's not surprising that they've thought about this a lot more than child psychiatrists. And there's quite a lot of research out there on other conditions that show that there are four vital elements that we need to think about. There's the transfer of information. By the time a young person is 18, they may have been in contact with a paediatrician, the same paediatrician perhaps, for all their lives. And there's a lot of information that may be recorded in their notes or maybe not. And it's really important that the, the bits of that that are important go with them. And I think somebody mentioned earlier, um, one of our young people mentioned, the um, hassle and how it undermines relationship when you have to tell your story time and time again. So information transfer is key. That it's planned that you don't just turn up for your appointment, for your review, and are told, well, next time you're going to see the, the blokes in the clinic, the other, you know, sorry, you're finished with us. Because if you've been coming for a long time, there, there, is, a separate, there is a loss. That ideally, if it's done well, can't we work together? You know, ch a child psychiatrist and adult psychiatrist share this, the, the first three years of their training. Can we not see some young people together? Because actually to do an introduction to help that person make the transition. And of course, continu continuity of key care is key. We want people to actually get there. And again, in NICE guidelines, if young people who have ADHD are on medication, it is enshrined in the guidelines that actually they should be having support with that, and it should be secondary health care of some sort. However, um, this is um, a publication um, of another study on transition that I was involved um, with about um, almost 10 years ago now called TRAC, and we looked at transition across all mental health conditions. And it won't surprise you that children with neuropsychiatric disorders, so ADHD and autism spectrum conditions, were among those who were worst served. But despite studying transitions um, across six different trusts, there weren't enough of them to really unpick what was going on. So that's led to this bit of work that I'm, Astrid and I are going to talk about. Um, but the other thing to think about is the maximum onset of many mental health conditions is just at the time that our services break. So if you were going to start from scratch and design 
mental health services, you wouldn't have children and adults services, you wouldn't have the break at 16, 17, 18, it should be 18, but it varies around the country. Because that's when the maximal onset of anxiety disorders and depression is. Now, there's a lot of continuity um, from those who do have problems in childhood and adulthood. It's not inevitable, but there is a lot of continuity. Um, and that adds into all the other transitions that young people end up having to deal with at the same time. School, leaving home, finding employment, changing of, of um, peer relationships. And if young people have a bad transition, or indeed no transition, there is a risk that they pick up other problems, both with their health, if they get into accidents, um, maybe they take up smoking, drinking, um, that has health risks, or maybe they have a rotten time and their mental health fails in other ways and they develop additional problems. So adult psychiatrists will say, we never see people with ADHD, they do they see them in their 20s and 30s with depression, with substance misuse. And actually, I think we could do better. We're kind of getting a C minus at the moment for how we handle this. So um, when we set up the study and we were talking to our colleagues who are practitioners, what the paediatricians um, tell us is that they, like they do with other um, health conditions, start trying to think about transition at about 14 but there isn't anywhere to go in many parts of the country. And what the child psychiatrists say to us is, well, they all drop out at 16, so we don't need to transition any. I think it's partly because we're not thinking about transition, and it may be partly that people like me, particularly in relation to medication, and I'm not saying medication is the only treatment, it's certainly not, um, but I often, when I was doing lots of clinical work, would have conversations with families about what the tablet will do and what it won't do and one of the things it will do is help children focus at school so i can imagine that you could start thinking well actually i'm not at school anymore so i don't need it so maybe there's there's something that child psychiatrists need to do differently and the um those that do run services for adults um, adult adhd say that actually we don't have that many who come straight across at 18 but we do see this group that come back um, often with their spouses in their mid-20s when they have accrued a lot of other difficulties. The other thing to say is it's not our colleagues who are adult psychiatrists being lazy. They're not trained to do, deal with this. At the time they, many of them trained, they were being told it wasn't really a disorder. They may have no experience of, of working with children or young people. You, you, when you train as a psychiatrist, you have, you have to do some developmental psychiatry, but that waxes and wanes. At the moment, you do. And you have a choice between working with people with a learning disability or working with children. So they, they have no training. So there's a training job to do, probably, or maybe with GPs. So the CATRA study um, has, is funded by um, the National Institute for Health Research, and Astrid is leading it. And it's set up to do three things. We want to get a level of need, um, because there are all these conflicting opinions among the people with the power to do something about how, how many young people there might be out there. We want to find how useful or not um, the current services for young adults are. We want to hear about people's experiences and their views on, on how we could do it better. And then when we applied for funding, um, the National Institute of Health Research said, we want you to map service. You need to do some mapping services, which made me giggle, because it's the Department of Health saying, tell us what we provide. We, we don't know. Can you, can you tell us, please? So we're going to do um, a range of different things to get at these... Um, these issues. There's a surveillance study which I will talk about, some qualitative um, data, which means finding out from various stakeholders their experiences, and then we will do the mapping mostly by surveys. But the bottom line is we are shining a torch on something we know is very more murky, and if that makes some people do something better, I'm, what we actually want to do is make the outcomes better for children and young people. So this is a very busy slide, but it's basically to say that Astrid and I are not doing this on our own. Um, we, are, we have um, Tracy Elliott from Cerebra as a co-applicant, and we have a parent, Catherine Schotten, whose husband and three of her four children have um, ADHD. So she brings the lived experience. And we have a young people's panel and a parent advisory group, which um, Astrid is going to talk about. 
And um, our team, our core research team, is now complete because Anna the Second has joined us. And she's Anna the Second because she's the second junior researcher, but she's also the second Anna um, because our administrator, who holds the whole thing together, is also Anna. And then we have Helen um, as our other researcher. So again, don't try and get the detail, but um, this is just to show you that the studies are all going along together. So you've got the surveillance. I'm using a color code. So the, the surveillance is um, in yellow, qualitative in green, and the mapping in blue. And we're about here. We're about six months in. So we can't give you a huge amount of results, um, but we can tell you how we're managing um, to go. If we haven't bored you too much, maybe we'll be invited back a few years' time when we've got some results to tell you. So the surveillance study. Now, this is to quantify how many young people with ADHD need transfer. And we know we're going to get a lower limit to this, a low, a low estimate. It will be an underestimate. But I think that puts us in a good position to negotiate with commissioners and policymakers that it's at least this many. And it'll be much more than is currently provided. It's run um, with the aid of two surveillance units, one at the Royal College of um, Pediatricians um, called the BPSU, and one at the Royal College of Psychiatrists called CAPS. And it's going to last for about um, 12 months. Um, and this is how it works. A card like that yellow card goes out to all consultant child psychiatrists and the pediatricians, I think, now get theirs by email, but it used to be an orange card. Um, and on that card is a list of all the studies that are being studied. And the pediatricians and child psychiatrists are asked, have you seen a case of any of these kind of conditions, or in our case, um, a rare event? And if you have, you tick a box. And if you haven't, you tick nothing to report. And for those practitioners in the room, if anyone here gets these cards, the nothing to report is really important. So please do send it back. We want to know who's getting the cards, because you're the the denominator, the bottom bit of the fraction. Um, and so we do need to know that you've seen nothing. So the BPSU and CAPS send the yellow card to the consultants and the psychiatrists, and they all send it back, or nearly all of them do. When we get a notification, the, the surveillance units let us know, and we send the pediatricians and the child psychiatrists a questionnaire, which they fill in and they send back to us. Um, and in fact, we do two questionnaires, one when they notify the case, and that's got six questions about details to check that actually this is a young person with ADHD who is on medication and it is coming up to transition because that's who we want to study, and a little bit about the services. And then we check in with them nine months later and say, what happened? Did they transition? And if so, where did they go? And then we're very lucky to be able to work with colleagues at the Institute of Psychiatry where Emily Simonoff works, where they have amazing clinical records that are all electronic. Um, actually, they serve four boroughs um, in London, and we'll be able to triangulate how many children there have been reported to us and get a sense of how good our data is. Which is important, because we know that not every psychiatrist will respond, and we need to make, have a sense of how accurate our estimate is. And this is where we're up to. We've had um, sort of just over 100 cases reported via the paediatric um, surveillance and by the child psychiatrists. We're chasing like mad because clinicians are all really very, very busy and our questionnaires are not necessarily the highest thing on their priority, but they are coming back in. The numbers don't look brilliant at the moment and that's because there's a time lag. The cards go out, they tick the box, they're sent back, there's a little while before we get the questionnaire back to them. So they are coming in. But again, any practitioners in the room, nag your consultants to send them back, help them send them back. And just to be clear, we are using medication, not because we think medication is absolutely essential for the support of young adults with ADHD, but it's to have to fit the nice guidelines so we can go back to the Department of Health and to commissioners and say, the nice guidelines say the best practice is for these young people to be seen in secondary health care. Um, and this is roughly how many of them you have in the British Isles. So this, this goes across England, Wales, Scotland, and both islands. And now I'm going to hand over to Astrid. Um, thank you. I thought keeping you awake by adding a little accent to my talk. So um, here we go. The qualitative study is one of these three streams that make up our um, whole study. Um, 
Apart from the fact that I really like this scheme, it also has a bit of a purpose. It'll tell you how that not only these three streams answer a different research question, they also link, link in with each other. So the methodology of each of these streams um, help each other and link in, which is, I think, quite, quite key to what we're trying to do here. So the qualitative work, um, I don't know whether you can read that, it says professionals or clinicians. Um, so we're going to do interviews with clinicians, with young people and with parents to understand their experiences of this transition from children's services to adult services. These clinicians, we will create a, a, a sample pool through our surveillance study. So the surveillance study, we know that everyone who sees a young person with ADHD is, will report this case, which means that everyone who reports a case deals with ADHD within their practice. So this is the ideal sample pool to um, select a few clinicians to talk to them about their transition experiences. In the follow-up period, which we're going to do as well. I don't know whether, did you mention that? You did. I wasn't paying attention. Um, so for those who either didn't pay attention as well, um, we're doing a nine month follow up, which means that after nine months, we're really asking them whether that young person has actually made the transition, has been accepted in the adult service. So that means we'll also ask them what service they've been referred to, which means that again, we'll know which adult practitioners work with um, young adults with ADHD. Again, we'll create a sample pool for us to ask clinicians to be interviewed by us. And the second and third group, which are young people and parents, uh, will be recruited through five NHS sites. So we've got the South London and Maudsley NHS Trust, who's involved Berkshire, Devon, Coventry and Warwickshire and Nottinghamshire. So if any of you out here is a parent of a young person with ADHD and has or uses services at one of these NHS trusts um, and you'd like to be involved, um, please let them know that you're interested in um, joining our study. So we'll be interviewing 15 clinicians in children's services, 15 in adult services, and we've, we've identified three important groups, we think. Basically, as Tamsin already mentioned, the 14 to, well, 16-year-olds to 18-year-olds, we know that there's a huge dropout of services. Um, we can't recruit young people who don't attend services anymore. So we're trying to look at those 14 to 16-year-olds who are pre-dropout age, and we want to know from them how they you know, how they perceive their medication, the services they're receiving, and how they, you know, see their future with or without ADHD and medication. We want to talk to those young people who literally recently transferred, so been accepted within adult service and had at least one appointment uh, because they'll have very fresh memories of how that went and how they've, like, literally experienced um, these last few months in their lives. Again, we know that a lot of these young people with ADHD will leave services before they reach adulthood. A lot of these young people will continue to have symptoms, and some of these symptoms will reach a certain threshold that they feel like they really need, again, support to cope with these symptoms. So the 20 to 25-year-olds who are re-entering services and have been diagnosed with ADHD during childhood, um, we'll, we'll try to find those as well and interview them and ask them and talk to them about you know, how ADHD influenced their childhood, how services were, and how they're experiencing adult services currently. Interviews with parents initially weren't on the agenda, but we've got a parent advisory group, and they thought it was really important to also talk to them and talk to them about the burden of having to either be able to stand along their, young, their, their child when they transition to adult services or when they're actually not included in the whole transition process at all. So they're represented as well. Um, with clinicians, we really want to talk about their, their practice, the model of service, um, nice guidelines and how much they follow them and why not, um, how much they involve the, the young person and parent in the whole transition process when they start this process, their personal experiences, so good experiences, bad experiences, 
things that perhaps hamper the whole um, process, we want to know all about it. We, young people and parents, we want to talk about current and future medication, current and future contact with services. Basically, we want to talk to them about their future. And I remember from this morning, I, th I thought it was a really lovely slide. Andrew showed a slide and he says, what is, it, what is really important for these young people and their parents is, is the future. And I haven't been able to ask you whether you can actually provide them with an answer to the question. But I know from other pediatricians that actually they say, it's the most difficult thing for us because actually we don't know what we can offer them. We, you know, it's, it's really tough. We can't, perhaps we avoid, perhaps we avoid this, this um, talk with them or perhaps we avoid this discussion because we can't really offer them or we don't know what to offer or what, what to talk about. So we're gonna ask them, the young people themselves, how they see their future and what should happen. Um, this is where we're at at the moment with the qualitative study. Um, the, pr the previous slide with the timeline shows you we've, we've been dealing with a lot of um, ethics and R&D, local R&D approval to literally be able to talk to um, some patients. So currently we're actually just ready to, to start, which is great. Um, we've just done some site visits and everyone's on board and we're really keen to um, talk to some young people and parents. We've had uh, two, two clinicians already been interviewed, three are planned, and we're hoping to talk to many more. We plan to do some framework analysis, but I'm not going to bore you with that and hope that perhaps in the future we can, we can tell you our story um, after we've done our analysis. Um, the mapping study, which is, again, something that was added, not at request of parents, although I, I'm sure... I'm sure that they'd be delighted to know where to go as well, um, but by our, um, our funder. And again, this stream gets a lot of input from the other two streams as well. So by, by doing the surveillance study, we will roughly know which services in the UK provide any kind of support for young people or young, young adults with ADHD. Again, in the nine-month follow-up, we will get information of services that do something around young adults with ADHD. The qualitative work might add some as well. And the main bit that we're going to do to um, know where services are and what these services provide is an electronic survey. So the Royal College of Psychiatrists has already agreed that we're allowed to use their database, so they will get um, emails with a link to a monkey survey with some questions about what service do you provide for young adults with ADHD and with what we mean, do you do only diagnosis, do you also do treatment, do you do something else as well, um, do you have dedicated time to work with young adults with ADHD, all sorts of questions, to literally try to get an idea of the, the service provision out there. We've got links with all sorts of ADHD support groups, but if you're not listed and you want to help us, um, please let us know. We've got clinical commissioning groups because we're quite sure that what actually already exists or what clinicians provide might be different from what clinical commissioning groups say they pay for, um, or the other way around. They say they pay for something, but it actually isn't there. Uh, we're also using postcards and website. Our website is available and you can complete um, yourself when you're using um, services for young, young children or young adults with ADHD and we're using um, social media. Um, if you've been walking around today and you've come up to um, Penn Cruz stand, who's also helping us with our PPI. You might have noticed this little card. It's still out there, I presume. So um, if you leave this talk, please go there. Um, it's a, a very basic postcard, um, and you can complete it at the back by telling us what services you use for your child's uh, ADHD or for, if you're a young adult yourself, um, you can complete it as well. I think I've got some time left, and actually I really don't want to miss out on this bit because I'm, I'm quite proud of not only the work that we do ourselves, but mainly the work that our parents and young people do um, in collaboration with us. So 
we, thanks to Peng Crew and Peng Pig at Peng Clark, um, we've got a parent advisory group and a young people's panel. So with the parent advisory group, we kind of get together roughly at least every six months, but at times we meet more when we feel that we could do with input from parents with young people with ADHD. Um, but this group particularly has been involved in 2014, which literally means that they've been involved from the very, very early ideas that we had about this project. So we, this project started in November 2015, so that's a year and a half in advance that this, this, these parents have been involved, knowing that we might not get the funding to do this project. They've been involved with us to, to tell us how to do this research. We have a parent co-applicant. Um, we have a good group of 20 parents who are interested.